We're going to read Psalm chapter 130, and there's a Bible right there in the pew in front of you. There should be, and it's on actual page 518 if you want to open it up, and we'll read together, or I'll read out loud if you'll follow with me. It's entitled, My Soul Waits for the Lord. It's a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. O Father, how we worship and praise and adore you. I pray that the truth of who you are will be revealed to us, Lord God, that we'll see you as you truly are. There's no one like you. You are the creator of all things, Father. You sustain all things. Your glory, your might, your wisdom, your strength, your power. Oh, Father, help us to see the truth, to know that those that are in Christ are yours and you are for them and you will not lose any of them, Lord God. Help us through our trials, our tribulations, our struggles, Lord God. I pray, Father, that you will give us the endurance, the steadfastness, the patience to know that you are God. And if you be for us, no one can be against us. Father, we thank you and praise you for letting us have Kevin Bigelow, Lord God, to teach us out of your word. I pray you bless him and bless us as a flock, Lord Jesus, that we might learn more about you and understand how to deal with these trials and tribulations that we face. We ask your Holy Spirit to come and teach us today. And in your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so I present Kevin Bigelow. You may be seated. Thanks, brother. Morning, guys. It's good to be with you again. Um, For those of you who I don't know, uh, I am the guy who sits in the old Sunday school records closet in the education building. Um, You're all elders and uh, Chris have been amazing partners for us and really great friends. And Back during COVID, I was studying in my garage, and uh, Chris texted me and said, hey, we have an office we'd like you to sit in. So I just wanted to say a couple of things before we get into the the text. Um, I know he's not here, and so I'm embarrassing him, but you guys have such an incredible privilege in Chris Partika. Uh, The list of men who love Jesus, love their church, and are faithful to the gospel is very, very short, and you guys have one. And so... um, you guys should love the snot out of him and be grateful to Christ uh, for him. So, um, you know, one of the things that I have had the privilege of using your all space to do quite a bit of recently is premarital counseling. And uh, one of the things that always comes up in premarital, at the end of the day, what people are looking at is how do I build a foundation of intimacy? In other words, like how do we set up our world, set up our marriage, set up our Uh, lives so that we're growing in intimacy and connection as we go. And one of the things that inevitably pops up is that although that's a great goal for your marriage, marriage is not your primary relationship. It's not the primary point of intimacy Christ is. And so this morning, uh, the question I'd like us to answer together is, what's the foundation of intimacy with Jesus? As we walk through life as uh, Christians, what does it look like to grow in our intimacy with Christ? Um, You guys don't have an outline behind you, so I'm going to give it to you if you want to write it down. We're going to look at three points. Uh, The first point is intimacy starts in the deeps, comes out of the depths. I'm letting you guys jot. I'll say them to you again as we go. So the first one is intimacy starts in the deeps. The second is that God is like Jesus. And then the third is intimacy starts in the waiting, comes from the waiting. 
All right, so what do I mean by uh, intimacy with Christ starts in the deeps? Gil just told you this, but this psalm that uh, we're looking at this morning, Psalm 130, is called a song of ascent. And what the songs of ascent were, were three times a year in ancient Israel, the uh, males would need to come up to Jerusalem for certain festivals of worship. But as they would come up, Jerusalem is this really interesting uh, feature topographically where it's built on a mountain that's nestled inside a mountain range. So what would happen is there's no cars, there's no planes. You either walk it on foot or if you're rich enough, somebody will, you know, an animal would carry you there. But inevitably what happens is as you're making your pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you would go through ravines. You would go up a false peak and then come back down it and then go back up and come back down. Inevitably what happens is as you're making your way up to the Lord in the midst of Jerusalem, that you're making your way through the deeps and through the ravines. Let me say this to you plainly. The metaphor of this psalm, the physical metaphor, is one coming up to the Lord from deep, dark places in the landscape. It's also a spiritual metaphor that says there is no coming up to Christ that doesn't start down at the deeps, that doesn't start down in the depths. And you go, that's, that's great, Kevin, but I thought that part of Christian maturity would be that things would become easier and easier, that as, they would, uh, as I grew in my holiness, that my life would work out better and I'd be filled with more comfort, except then you have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, if you guys know him, is uh, the man who took the gospel to the Gentiles, planted a lot of the original churches. And I want to just read to you, you can put your finger in this if you want to look at it, uh, 2 Corinthians. I'm going to look at, read something from chapter 1 and then we'll look at chapter 4. Um, but Paul writes 2 Corinthians towards the end of his ministry by virtue of it being the second letter to the church in Corinth. There's already been a first one which means this is years after he has successfully planted several churches, pastored them through their maturity. He's now writing to them again. So this is a man who's deep into his life as an apostle. He's uh, well on his way into knowing Jesus. He is um, the pastor who's raised up all the pastors. Right? Listen to what Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians 1. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And then later in chapter 4, you guys are more familiar with this one, Paul says, we are afflicted in every way. We are perplexed. We are persecuted. We are struck down. We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. If these are the words that Paul writes towards the end of his apostolic ministry, after he has planted several churches all around the known world, then here's the thing. There is no amount of Christian maturity or missional commitment that will get you out of suffering. Let me say it to you differently. Part of your growing intimacy with Christ and the maturity in your relationship with Jesus doesn't run from the deeps, but actually happens in the deeps. That's what's happening here. Yes, thank you. You know, you go, well, why? What's going on with that? Why is it that the deep places are what lead to intimacy? You know, what's happening in your life as you come to Christ is the life of Christ or the person, the story of Christ is breaking out among you. And it's important to think through uh, what was the pattern of Christ, Christ's earthly ministry of the, his first uh, time on the planet you know, what, we're, what we love the most and what we think about the most is the resurrection of Christ. We have a whole holiday built around it. It's Easter, right? But there is no resurrection of Christ that doesn't pass 
through the death of Christ. So the necessary antecedent to it is dying. The pain of the tomb is what produces resurrection. The second thing is there's also the glory of Christ, which is Christ getting out of the grave, transformed, not just resuscitated, but resurrected, now reigning in heaven. Do you all know there's a man right now sitting on the throne of grace? The one ordering the cosmos right now is a human. It's crazy to think about. But what led to the glory of Christ, listen, is the dying of Christ. Now here's the good news of that. There is no death of Jesus, no dying of Christ, that does not have resurrection follow it. There is no pain and dying of Christ that doesn't have glory follow it. There's also no glory and no resurrection apart from dying. Do you see that? So what Paul is saying here, what the psalmist is learning early, early on, is that our intimacy with Christ now while we wait on Him grows through the dying. In other words, eventually it's going to be the resurrected life of Christ that breaks out among you, but right now it's the death of Christ that's breaking out among you. That as you wait in the already, not yet, there are some things that have been promised, some things that have happened, but you overwhelmingly live in the not yet. Why am I bringing all that up this morning? It uh, can be a depressing place to start a sermon. You know, I've got, um, for those of you who do know me, I've got a three-year, I've got a couple kids, but our, our three-year-old um, has this funny way of, um, well, let me tell you the story, so I don't bury the lead. Y'all know what the nugget is? Those of you who have kids, no? Okay. Everybody who doesn't have kids is like giving me the look right now. The nugget is um, these modular couches. They're cushions that you can put into different shapes, and so the kids can sit on them and play on them, and they do acro on them. And We have a couple of them, but we leave them in the corner of our family room, and inevitably, our three-year-old can get up on top of them and then manage to get himself... Uh, slid down in between the family room wall and the nugget. And it's not a problem for me, but the problem with being three is it comes up to his armpits. And so inevitably, I'll be in a different room, and all I hear is, Daddy, I'm stuck. And then I'll be like, Huh? (laughs) And I'll say, Daddy, I'm stuck. And then eventually, I'll figure out what's going on, and I'll go in, and I'll pick up Judah... And I'll just lift him up out, and we'll go on to playing. Judah never panics during any of this. He just tells me what's happening. Because he's seen me pull him out of this corner a million times. And he's never afraid of climbing back down in, into it, because he'll get pulled out of it. That's the human condition, is to find ourselves stuck again and again and again again. And yet, it is the exact opportunity for intimacy. Let me just flip all that over to you one more time. There's a tendency in our story to relate to God as if what God wants is for you to climb up to the top of the mountain, clean yourself up, bootstrap your way through it, get yourself cleaned up, and God will love you. But what you see here is that what leads to intimacy is actually the opposite. It's growing in your honesty and integrity about the brokenness in you and around you. So first question, I just want you guys, you can think about it when you go home, talk with a friend or a spouse, but what is it, the pain in your life, the the dying in your life that you're feeling tempted to run from rather than face and turn into? What's the, the thing that like, man, if I could just act like this isn't happening, everything would be okay, right? All right. You know, my um, reason I'm asking you that is because the story of Christ will invite you out of that. And just to give you an example, uh, this past Friday, so um, my wife is a church planter's wife and mom of the three kids and is insanely busy, tons of chaos. So she doesn't get out a ton. Uh, But this Friday, she had a chance to go to a girls' night with a bunch of other moms 
And what they did is they went to a friend's house and they did a murder mystery night. Have you all seen these? So you buy this, uh, I don't know, this program, I guess, and everybody gets assigned a character. And then what you do is you show, you dress up like your character. Jen, if you all know my wife, you'll know how funny this is. Um, she was an 18-year-old punk rock uh, woman, which is like the exact antithesis of who, who, my, who my bride is. But Friday night, she's got like cargo pants on. She's trying to find combat boots. She's got her hair up. She's wearing a tank top. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And um, what you do is you go there, and then you have to pick a card. And when you pick your card, you find out whether or not you're guilty or innocent. And then a series of questions unfolds through the night where you're trying to figure out who the guilty or innocent one is. So Jen's whole ride there, she's wondering, am I going to be guilty or not? Jen was innocent. But the whole night, you're sitting in the room surrounded by people who are potentially guilty of murder. See that? Now imagine if Jen came home so wrecked by that experience that she couldn't sleep, she stopped eating. I would call you guys and be like, what do I do? Because you guys would be like, this is crazy town. It was just a game. See, the reason we would do that is because the story's not true. Jen's murder mystery night is just a game. It was just a story. The real story is a different story than that one. And so her sanity, her flourishing, comes from coming back into reality. Now, why am I bringing that up? You know, one of the things that happens when you hit the deeps is it dislocates you. Right? Because you come to Christ and you anticipate that you're going to go from chaos to rest, that you're going to go from guilt to comfort, that you're going to go from fear to courage, that you're going to go from one degree of glory to the next, which is what the scriptures say. But then all of a sudden, you get whacked by life. And you go, this isn't the way I thought the story was supposed to go. And so in your dislocation, what you do is you go, what story am I living in? I'm not even sure which one is true right now. And so in that chaos, what can happen is that you can become disoriented, but disorientation is also a good thing. Here's, I was talking with a, a counselor this week. Oh, there we go. That's louder. Sorry, guys. Um, I was talking with the, my counselor this week, and we were talking about disorientation. And my, my own personal tendency is to relate to disorientation as if it's a problem. And what I do is I seek orientation, meaning I feel crazy, I don't know what's going on, and so I try to get control of it and try to make sense out of it till, till I understand the problem, I understand the narrative, and now I know how to live in the middle of it, right? Except here's the problem. Disorientation is a feature of this life. And rather than looking for orientation in the midst of it, what we do is we look for Christ in the midst of it. Right? And then seeing Christ, Christ becomes our orientation. And so what is some of the disorientation that we live in the midst of? Here's the primary one. Again, we're talking about intimacy with Christ. Right? When you guys think through, for those of you who, who are married or for those of you who've been to a wedding, um, and you think about the build-up to the wedding day, I mean, that is probably, just in honesty, probably the fittest day of both the husband and the wife. There's like exercise and diets and you're glammed up and everybody who's with you is also looking glammed up. It would be weird for your best man to show up shabby, right? Why is that? Because every single story that man has taught us is you are loved by being lovely. If you want to be loved, be lovely. And so we prepare for intimacy by cleaning ourselves up. The reason we get that story is because man's love is based on consumption. Man consumes. 
What's different about Jesus than that? Jesus' love doesn't take, it gives. It doesn't consume, it provides. What that means is that Jesus doesn't love you because you're lovely. Jesus makes you lovely by loving you. I'm not the first person who's ever said that. It's just something that bears repeating. The difference in your relationship with Christ versus any other relationship is that it's not based on you being lovely. It's based on you being loved. That's why the depths matter. You go, Kevin, where are you getting that from? That sounds great, but look at verses 3 and 4. If you, O Yahweh, should mark iniquities, O Adonai, who could stand? If intimacy with you was based on a report card, Who could possibly stand up underneath that? Who could be lovely enough for God to love him? But, the contrastive, right? But, with you, there's forgiveness that you may be feared. What the being feared here means is my intimacy with you has come with such gravity that it shapes my life. That's what that means. This doesn't mean terrified. It means overwhelmed by his person, right? Reverence. But notice that it doesn't say with you there is forbearance. God just looks the other way and moves on. It says there's forgiveness. You know the story of a family who, um, in the process of refinancing their uh, mortgage, a second loan had been um, forbeared. You know, it had just been like, you don't need to pay it, it's okay, it just goes away. But then years later, I think actually decades later, um, yeah, I think so, I think a decade later, uh, another party bought that mortgage. And so this old debt was still on the books. And do you know what happened? that new provider decided to call the debt. That's forbearance. That means the debt doesn't need to be paid, but it's still hanging out there. The idea of forbearance with God should terrify you. Because it means if there is a debt that God can still call in, you will not be able to pay it. If intimacy with Christ is based on forbearance, meaning based on just move on and act like it didn't happen, then the only option you would have would be to flee or fight. To run or resist Him. But it says, but with you there's forgiveness. The difference between forgiveness and forbearance is a debt that's been paid. It's been canceled. I had a, um, like a blood test bill I had to pay, and I, I was long, I way overdue on it. And so I logged in, and I tried to figure out how to pay it, and it said balance zero, and I was like, oh no, I, it, there's going to be some clerical error that like a hundred years from now, my credit report is going to have this thing on it, and I don't even know who to call and how to get, but I click on it, and you know what it said? Paid in full. That's the difference. With Christ, your sin has not been forbeared. It has been paid for. Now, why am I bringing that up in the midst of intimacy? One is, the primary deep that you experience in your life is your sinfulness. It's the separation between you and God. It is the fundamental ravine with Him up there. You can't close that gap. But the second is the bigger one. You know, somebody in our uh, church, in our community group one one night said, um, you know what strikes me about the gospel is not that Jesus is like God, but that God is like Jesus. That's what John 1 is saying, is that no one's ever seen the Father, but the only God who's at the Father's side, He has made Him known. 
right? That who God is, we know through who Christ is. What's that mean? It means it is the nature and character of God. Not to expect you to climb up out of the deeps, but to climb down in them with you. In other words, what it means to be God is to be sufficient for those who are insufficient. It means mercy is what dwells in the deepest part of who God is. So back to that question I was asking you, what is the thing that you want to run from? You know why you want to run from it? It's because you feel insufficient in the midst of it, and of course you do. You're not made to live in a broken world, and you're not made to live as a broken person. You were made, your longings were made, to be an intact person living in an intact world. You're not sufficient for the situation you find yourself in. The difference is whether we try to run from it, which you'll never be able to do, or has Christ given it to you as a place to find His face? What I mean by that is you turn towards it and then turn towards Christ and wait on Him to be sufficient for you. So what should we do? What's that look like? What does it look like to grow in intimacy with Christ? You know, um, this morning, filled with Judah stories, but um, our three-year-old uh, comes running to me and goes, Daddy, I want a Pop-Tart. I was like, well, I'll go ask, I'm, you know, working. I'd go ask Mama. And so he goes, Mama, Mama, I'm so hungry. Can I have Pop-Tart? And everything that I gathered that happened next was she said yes. But wait. Because she was in the shower. Right? It's a couple minutes go by, and, and I hear Judah yelling at his mom, going, you said you were going to, you never got me a, and I said, son, come here. I said, Judah, what's going on? He said, well, mommy never got me the Pop-Tart. And I said, buddy, what did mommy say? She said she would come out and get it. I said, buddy, mommy said Yes. You just got to wait. Waiting's a yes. Waiting's not a no. Waiting's a yes. When we cry out to the Lord in the midst of the deeps, the next thing we do is we wait. But we wait because it's a yes. Not for a yes, but because everything in Christ is yes and amen. The temptation of our life is to take the delay and interpret it as no. That's what Judah did this morning. The reason you do that is not because you're three, it's because you're human. It's what you, have in, what you, me, and Judah all have in common is we're human. We respond to the waiting by thinking it's no. But how do we know it's not no? You know, there's this really interesting part of verse 5. Verses 5 and 6 say, wait for Yahweh, my soul waits, my soul waits. Right in the middle of verse 5 though, it says, and in His word I hope. You know, when we read that... um, depending on you know, our, our story and where we come from, it's tempting to read that uh, lawishly. Our legalness comes out when we read that. Uh, and what we read there is, I'm going to wait on the Lord and build my life around His moral commands. I'm going to study the Bible hard and shape my life around the Ten Commandments until Jesus comes back. And don't hear me in any way undermining that project. I'm I'm not telling you not to do that. That's just not what this is saying. This psalm is written during the 70 years 
that Judah is in exile in Babylon. They're not capable of keeping the ceremonial law. And it is their inability to keep the moral law that has put them in the exile. This is not saying build your life upon the Bible. You know what this is saying? There was a night the other week where my wife and I got, not into a fight, but into like a little bit of a tension. And it was because it was like 8.30 and I was about ready to turn the Nintendo Switch on with my uh, fourth grader. And from her perspective, she was like, what are you doing? You know, it's, be- it's way past bedtime. Now's not the time for Nintendo Switch. Except what she had not seen is for three days, I had been promising to Caleb that we would play Nintendo Switch before this, the weekend was over. And what was hanging in the balance was whether or not I was going, now listen, to keep my word or not. I didn't have to play with him for even more than two minutes. I just needed to keep my word. Because I need Caleb to be able to hope in my word. See, that's what the psalmist is saying here is, When we wait, we wait with anticipation on one whose word will be kept. In other words, he's saying we hope in his promises. Why? Because he already kept them. Not just kept them for you, but kept them to you. Christ getting out of the grave is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises. But here's the thing. The certainty of His keeping His future promises isn't about you. It's about Jesus. If God didn't keep His promises to you, He would be breaking them to Jesus. It means the work that Christ has done was wasted, wasn't effective, The reason you can be absolutely certain of the good that will come out of the deeps is because God the Father will never be unjust towards God the Son, and God the Son has done His part. You go, that all sounds great, Kevin. How certain can I be? You know, this this, uh, verse 6 can feel pretty far away uh, for us because we don't live in fourth or fifth century BC Israel or Babylonia. Right now, if you just look up, you could count, but count this number of sources of light that are in this room right now that you have utter control over. You'll flick a switch and all these will come on or all these will go off and the clock will turn off and this will turn on, right? That's not the case when they write this. What a watchman would do is the moment that a village or a city is going to get attacked is in the middle of the night. And it's because there's no alarms and no floodlights that will light up the plain. If an army is going to sneak up, they're going to do it quietly with no light in the middle of the night. You'll wake up and boom, there's an entire army outside your gate. So the way they would respond to this is they would establish watchmen, men who would stand up on parapets and just scan the plain until the sun came up. The reason they did that is because the moment the sun came up, the risk was over. The project was over. But do you know why they were able to wait and watch for the morning? Because the darkness does not define whether the sun is going to rise or not. The sun rising defines whether it remains dark or not. You see that? Except they learned to wait because it was an absolute certainty that the sun would rise. Okay. How sure can you be that God will work out this deep thing in mercy and for resurrection and towards His glory? Do you know what Psalm 130 is saying? 
you would have a better shot at the sun not coming up tomorrow morning than God not keeping His promises. Absolutely certain. And you go, I know, Kevin, but that sounds... Last point, promise. That sounds crazy. If you knew the thing I'm dealing with, you would know it's not that simple. And do you know what I would say to you? You're right, it's not that easy. But it is that simple. Y'all know the difference there between hard and straightforward and easy and complicated? (laughs) Yeah? Hard, but straightforward. Why? Why? There's this really interesting word in verse 7. Um, it says, For with Yahweh there's steadfast love. That means His has said does not move. His affection towards you, His commitment to you isn't fickle like ours is. God's faithful, not fickle. But then the second half of verse 7 says, And with Him is plentiful redemption. And you go, well, there's a word. <laughs> I don't ever use the word plentiful in my life. I think, I think I, there's like five or six different like pharmaceutical things that go through my head when I hear that word. But um, it's not a word we're real familiar with. But what's sweet about it is when you click into the Hebrew word that lays underneath that one. Do you know the very first time that word is used? I, you shouldn't. It's Genesis 1.22. Do you all know that reference? Genesis 1.22 is after God makes Adam and Eve. And then he looks at them and he says, I'm paraphrasing here, based on who you are, here's what flourishing looks like. Be fruitful and multiply. It means in every situation break out in flourishing. The two of you make more of you. Fill the earth with more of you. The word plentiful means multiply. The first time it's used. What that means is not that God has the ability and is just waiting to see if He'll work redemption. It means that the character and nature of God's mercy is to multiply. It means it is to meet every single new insufficiency and be sufficient for you. What's that mean? There's no need that you have of Him that's bigger than His mercy. And there's no shape of your need for Him that His mercy can't multiply into. So what I wanted you to see this morning is that intimacy with Christ doesn't grow by avoiding the deeps. It grows by becoming more honest about the deeps. And the reason is because the glory of God is not based on your sufficiency, but His. And the project of His life in you is Him being sufficient for you. So what that means is He spends every single moment of your life walking you deeper and deeper into your insufficiency so that He can love you and join you in the midst of it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank You for Your grace. Thank You that our intimacy with You is not based on our loveliness, but our lovedness. That our intimacy with you isn't based on who we are and what we've done, but it's who you are and what you're doing. Because, Lord, who you are doesn't change. And so, Lord, help us day by day to enter your rest. Lord, to find our joy in you, to take courage in you. Lord, I pray for Ocean Park. Thank you for their friendship. Thank you for their ministry. Thank you for their proclamation of the gospel here in the beaches. And I pray that you day by day, would be bringing them into rest and that you would be multiplying them even as your mercy multiplies in their story that you would be multiplying this congregation. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.